Julius Caesar by William Shakespeare. Our story takes place in the heart of one of the greatest civilizations in the ancient world. No, the other one. No, no, Rome, Rome. There we go. <clears throat> the story begins in Rome as Julius Caesar returns to the Eternal City, basking in the afterglow from his military victories. Everyone is super excited. Well, not everyone. Some of the nobles are not exactly thrilled with Caesar's growing power and influence among the common rabble. Caesar and his posse are on their way to a foot race. With Caesar is his loyal companion and fellow soldier, Mark Anthony. Suddenly, an old soothsayer appears with an ominous warning. Beware the Ides of March. What says to me now? Beware the Ides of March. Caesar, arrogant and feeling invincible, blows off the fellow and exits. But two noblemen are suspicious of Caesar and his growing power. The first is Cassius, a longtime friend of Caesar's. Or is he? He is jealous of Caesar and hates that one man can have so much power and control. The second is the noble and true Brutus, another friend of Caesar's. He loves Caesar, but places the good of Rome above all else. Brutus and Cassius hear the crowd shout three times during the race, Huzzah! 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 Casca, another nobleman, exits the race and informs them that Antony just offered Caesar a crown three times, but Caesar refused each time, albeit reluctantly. Later, a terrible storm descends upon Rome. Casca and Cicero, another senator, meet on the street. Casca tells Cicero that he's seen some weird things taking place in the city. An owl in the daytime, a lion in the capital, men on fire walking through the streets. Do these events foreshadow dangers yet to come? Cassius, on the other hand, is pleased as punch about the events. He believes the savage storm and strange sightings are portents of doom from the gods warning the Romans about Caesar. Casca gives Cassius some news. Indeed, they say the senators tomorrow mean to establish Caesar as a king. So the two conspirators plot against Caesar and, knowing they need some clout, decide that they need to bring Honorable Brutus to their cause. Slam cut, this time to Brutus's pad. Brutus is torn. He knows that Caesar must die, but he loves Caesar. Isn't it only a matter of time before all that muscle and might went to Caesar's head and he became a tyrant? Suddenly, Cassius, Casca, and the rest of the conniving crew of conspiratorial conspirators arrive. They decide that the welfare of Rome demands Caesar's death. Cassius suggests that they kill Anthony too while they're at it. But worthy Brutus reminds them that they only stand against Caesar. They can't be seen as butchers. And besides, Brutus tells them, Anthony would be rendered harmless once Caesar is out of the way. And for Mark Anthony, think not of him, for he can do no more than Caesar's arm when Caesar's head is off. Oh, Brutus. Brutus, Brutus, Brutus. Our attention now turns to the venerable Caesar's house. Caesar cannot sleep. He wanders through the house, kept awake by his wife Calpurnia's nightmares. Calpurnia tells Caesar that he mustn't leave the house. There's lightning, lioness is giving birth in the street, and the dead wandering around town. These are all omens that warn of danger. Caesar blows her off, telling her that the signs apply to everyone and not just to him personally. Besides, Cowards die many times before their deaths. The valiant never taste of death but once. Then a nobleman named Decius arrives with a hearty, Caesar, oh hail, ready to bring Caesar to the Senate. But Caesar decides to stay home. Calpurnia had a dream, he tells him, where his statue spouted blood from many holes and smiling Romans bathed in the blood. She thinks the dream foreshadows danger against Caesar. But Decius disagrees with Calpurnia's interpretation of the dream. He says that the dream means that the Roman people will gain life from his blood. He also confides that the Senate wants to give Caesar the crown today, and if Caesar doesn't show up, well, the wishy-washy Senate might change its mind. In the end, Caesar agrees to go. Caesar, 
oblivious to any potential danger, arrives at the Senate and is soon mobbed by the other senators. The conspirators surround Caesar, distracting him by begging for favors, waiting for the right moment. Then the conspirators strike. Casca attacks first, stabbing Caesar. The others follow, hacking at the beloved Roman leader with their deadly, cruel blades. Finally, it is noble Brutus's turn. He approaches the wannabe king and administers the coup de gras. Caesar falls and speaks those final, fateful, and famous last words. A tu Brute? Caesar's friend Mark Anthony, who had run away during the attack, returns. He tells the conspirators that if they intend to kill him, then he can't think of a better place to die than beside Caesar. Brutus explains that they have not assassinated Caesar out of cruelty, but because of their love for the Roman people. Anthony asks the conspirators if he can give Caesar's funeral oration in the forum. Brutus gives the okay, but Gassius is against the idea. He thinks Anthony will sway the people against the conspirators. Brutus says that after he explains their motivation for killing Caesar to the crowd, he will allow Anthony to speak. The Roman people will be moved by the conspirators' generosity. Brutus asks Anthony to speak well of the conspirators since they are doing him a favor, and he agrees. In an impassioned speech to a raucous crowd in the Roman Forum, Brutus justifies the conspirators' actions, telling the crowd that although they cared for their beloved Caesar, they cared for Rome more, and their love for Rome made the murder necessary. He also tells them that Antony had no part in the assassination and that he will be part of the new commonwealth. The crowd cheers, moved by Brutus's kindness. It is now Antony's turn to speak. Antony steps up and addresses the crowd with the immortal words, Friends, Romans, countrymen, lend me your ears. What follows is a textbook example of how to persuade a crowd to your side while at the same time not so subtly throwing the other guys under the bus. Anthony begins by praising Caesar and grieving for his friend and asks the crowd if Caesar really was ambitious, reminding them about all the wonderful things Caesar did for the people of Rome. Anthony then holds up Caesar's cloak and points out all the holes where the senator stabbed him, focusing on Brutus's evil cuts. Brutus, whom Caesar loved so dearly. Then Anthony reads aloud Caesar's will and tells the crowd that Caesar has left the Roman people an enormous amount of money and property. What kind of monsters would kill such a generous ruler? Oh, the crowd is frothing now. Anthony has won. His words have turned the crowd against the conspirators. The crowd is outraged by Caesar's murder and is thirsty for the conspirators' blood. Brutus, Cassius, and the other conspirators, seeing the Roman mob out for revenge, get the heck out of Dodge. Caesar is dead. His assassins have run off. Rome is now in a civil war. On one side, we have Antony, Julius Caesar's nephew Octavius, and Lepidus, the third member of this new coalition who have taken over Rome. They raise an army to fight against the army assembled by Cassius and Brutus. Meanwhile, in northern Greece, the bromance between Cassius and Brutus appears to be fizzling. Brutus, forever noble, becomes angry with Cassius for taking bribes and not sending money to pay the troops. Cassius accuses Brutus of no longer loving him and melodramatically offers his dagger to Brutus to kill him. There is my dagger, and here my naked breast. Strike as thou didst at Caesar. Brutus tells Cassius to put his dagger away, and the two make amends. In his tent later that night, Brutus reads, And who should appear? Great Caesar's ghost, it's Great Caesar's ghost! The spectral apparition speaks, telling Brutus that they will see each other again at Philippi, where the two armies will clash. The stage is now set for the battle. The two opposing forces meet on the battlefield. Men march, flags flap, soldiers slice with their swords and stop slashing strokes with their shields. During the battle, 
Cassius spots some unknown soldiers and sends his buddy to find out who these guys are. Although his buddy meets friendly soldiers, Cassius thinks his friend has been captured. Cassius is overcome with emotion and asks a servant to kill him. Caesar, thou art revenge, even with the sword that kills thee. And he dies. The armies fight again! More men marching and slashing and hacking and stabbing and slicing and dicing and dying. But this time, Brutus' army loses. Oh, brave and noble Brutus, deep in thy honorable heart, thou knowest thy hour is at hand. Before he can be captured, Brutus, in true Roman fashion, takes the only honorable option left to him. The battle is over. Anthony and Octavius are victorious. Anthony, Octavius, and the rest of the army soon come across the noble Brutus' lifeless corpse. Anthony stands over Brutus and declares, This was the noblest Roman of them all. All the conspirators, save only he, did that they did in envy of great Caesar. He only had a general honest thought, and common good to all made one of them. The end.